Hello there, I'm Greg and welcome to my channel, Midnight Oil Software. On this channel, I talk about game development using Unity and also digital art. Today, I'm gonna to do an episode where I'll teach you how to build the classic arcade game, Star Castle, from scratch using Unity. We'll start out by creating a brand new Unity project. We'll import some assets that I wanna use from the project. And we'll also import some sound effects uh, both from the Asset Store and from freesound.org. So first we're going to start off here in Unity Hub. If you haven't already, you need to go and install Unity Hub and at least one version of the Unity game engine. I'm going to be using the latest version, uh, which is 2021.3.1 F1 LTS. It is the latest longtime support or LTS version of Unity. And I really strongly suggest that you use that version because I'm probably going to be using some of the C Sharp 8 features uh, that were introduced in that version of Unity. Uh, so we're going to start by creating a brand new project. Uh, and like I mentioned, if you don't already have Unity Hub, go ahead and pause the video. I'll put a link in the description uh, where you can go and grab Unity Hub. Uh, and once you've done that, come back and resume the video. And when you're back to this screen, we will click New Project. And I'm going to pick 2D Core as the project template that we're going to use for this. It is a 2D game. And then we're going to give it a name. And I'm just going to call it Star Castle. And I'm putting it in a folder on my D drive called Unity Projects. And it's going to spend a little time thinking about that, building the project. And I will go ahead and pause the video here and then speed it up and resume it when we get done creating that project. Okay, so once Unity has finished creating that project, you should see something very similar to this. Uh, I'm going to rearrange these uh, windows when we actually start developing, but for now, what I wanna do is I wanna switch over to my browser and up on the Unity Asset Store, I have searched for and found some assets that I want to import into our game. Now, the first one is this 2D space kit. Um, it's got a lot of really cool assets, some really nice graphics that I want to use in our game. Uh, the other thing I want to do, uh, I found some free music tracks. This track here is called Zephyr. That might be some nice backing music for our game. I also found some sound effects, uh, some free laser weapons. So I'm gonna import these. Now, normally um, when you go into Unity and you search for and find an asset you don't already have, you have to come over here and click add to assets. So I'm gonna add that to my assets. We'll let that do its thing. And then I've already um, added this one to my assets. So I just need to add this free music to my assets. And then the other assets I'm gonna bring in, I went to this site called freesound.org and I will put some links in the uh, description of the video so you can find this. I want to find something that I think would be a nice sound. So this is a loop. We can play this in a loop and when you're thrusting your ship around, I think that that one would work. And you want to look for assets on here that are public domain or there's other licenses. There is an attribution non-commercial where you can use it in a non-commercial app as long as you attribute the author. Um, but in this particular case, I'm gonna use this asset, which I know is public domain. Um, so I don't have to attribute the author. Um, there's no limitation. So I'm going to pick this. I don't know why it says this. There's nothing inappropriate about this um, sound. So I'm downloading that. And I also, was trying to find some decent explosion sounds. Let's see what we got up here. Don't want that. And again, I'm looking for 
public domain sounds. Holy smoke! That one... That one might do for when the um, ship, the player ship is destroyed. So I'll go ahead and download that. And we'll pull them into our game. Uh, but first, we're going to go into our game. And we're going to open up the package manager. So you go into window, package manager. And initially, it's going to show you the packages that are already in your project. So these are the packages that got imported based on that 2D template that I created. Uh, we want to switch over to my assets. And so these are all the assets that I've gotten off of the asset store that are available to me. And I, I want this 2D space kit here. So I'm going to import that. And this will take a little while for Unity to import that. So when it gets done importing, it shows you this little dialog where you can select what you want to import from that package. And normally I would be very selective about what I want to pull in because uh, you don't want to bloat your project. In fact, what I usually do is I'll have a separate project where I'll import any assets that I want to pull in and then I'll just export the actual ones I want to use in my game and then import only those. But for the sake of this demonstration, we're just going to import the entire package. Okay, and so when that's done, you can see under assets, we now have the 2D space kit. So you remember there was an asset called free sound effects. Well, there's free music tracks and free laser weapons. So if we go back into our game and to the asset package manager and just search for free music tracks for games, we need to download that shouldn't take too long it's just a few songs and when it's done downloading we can click import I'm not sure I might use some of the other songs like for the menu the, the start menu and the game over screen so we'll just go ahead and bring in all those songs all right after we've done that we'll go up here to the free laser weapons download that import and I really don't know which ones I'm going to use we'll go ahead and import them all all right so now we can close the package manager and you can see here under assets that we've got all of these things that we've imported now I'm going to create a folder I like to organize things and I'm going to call these third party and I'm going to drag all of these assets that I've imported from the asset store into third party. This is just going to help me to organize my project a little better. And the other thing I like to do is I like to create a subfolder at the root of my assets folder and I like to call it underscore project. Now I got this idea from the Infallible Code YouTube channel. This is always going to show up at the top of our hierarchy. Where did I put it? Ah, okay. There we go. So that's up at the top of our hierarchy. And then I'm going to drag scenes inside of there. So. Whenever I'm looking at my hierarchy here, as I begin to get more and more components in my game, my stuff that I'm writing that's specific to this project is going to go in this project folder. It's always going to show up at the top because of this underscore. And then any third-party packages I import are down here. And Unity is smart enough to know, even though I've moved this to another folder, it, it keeps the um, relationships correct so it will find these things no matter what folder I drag them into. Now I'm going to go into my scenes folder and I'm going to rename this sample scene and I'm going to call this main C. 
scene. And by default, the main scene just contains our main camera. And one thing I'm gonna to wanna to do is I'm gonna set the background color of this camera to be black. And so if we look at the game view, you can see that's all black. And I'm gonna to wanna to add a background. And actually, before I get too far ahead of myself, I wanna do a little bit more organizing of our project. So we have under assets, project and scenes. Um, let me go ahead and create some more subfolders here because I know I'm going to want to create some scripts. So let's create a folder and call it scripts. Um, I'm going to want to have a folder for materials in physics materials. And I'm going to want to pull in some sound effects. I'll just call it sounds. I'm going to go into that sounds folder. And I'm going to drag in those sounds that we got from freesound.org. That's loud. <laughs> okay. So those are those sounds. Now I want to do some organization up here in our hierarchy. And actually before that, I want to organize my workspace a little bit. So we've got our inspector over here. We got our project over here. I'm going to take, I'm going to actually take the hierarchy and dock it to the right here. And then I'm going to dock my project underneath of that. And I'm going to dock the console down here. This gives me a lot more room to work over here and I'm going to take the scene view and dock it beneath the game view. So this way I can always see both the game view and the scene view simultaneously. And I'm going to go back into our hierarchy here under main scene and I'm going to create a empty game object by going, I'm right clicking and I'm saying create empty and I'm just going to rename this dash 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 system dash 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 and I'm going to drag the camera into that and I want to go ahead and reset the position of that to zero 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 okay so our cameras in there now I'm going to put other things in there in the future I'm going to create another empty game object and I'm going to call this background And I'm going to go into that wonderful third party 2D space kit assets folder. And I want to look at some of the stuff we've got here. There's some background elements uh, and there's backgrounds. So looking at these backgrounds, there's a pretty cool looking star field there. There's another one with some cool nebulosity. Ooh, that's pretty cool. That's a really long nebula. There's some more cloudy stuff. So I'm trying to find something I think would look good for the background. I think that's the one I like the best so far. I'm gonna take that. I'm gonna drag it over there and reset its transform. So you can see it's filled our background with all of that. Now I also want to put this on a sorting layer. So by default, Unity layers things or renders things in order of their sorting layer. So we can actually add a sorting layer. Right now there's only one and it's called default. I'm gonna add one and call it background. And so background will render on top of default. If I go back in here and I change its sorting layer to background, and its order in that layer is zero. So the higher the number, the later it gets rendered. So something that's in order, uh, ordered one in the background layer will layer on top of something at uh, order in layer zero uh, and so forth. I'm gonna rename this Starfield. Now this is our camera view, this, this white box here, and that 
you can see it corresponding up there and I'm going to change by the way our resolution I'm going to change it to 1920 by 1280 so this is the resolution of our game now and you can see the camera is only filling up a small portion of that or that that Starfield is, is really extending beyond the bounds of our camera view. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick our camera. And down here under size, I'm just going to start increasing that size. And I'm going to increase it. Let's see. If I pick this, I can move our camera. So it's a little bit too big because this star field is extending beyond the bounds. So I'm going to make its size a little bit smaller there. So now the star field completely fills that game view. If I was to click play, This is our game view. Another thing you can do is here it says play focused for the game view. We could tell it to play maximized. And now when I click play, the game view fills up the entire screen. And so I think that looks really nice for the background of our game. The other thing you may have noticed is when I clicked play, my user interface turned green. So that is because of a setting that I set. If you go under Edit, Preferences, Colors, there's this Play Mode Tint. And whatever color we set this to, it's going to tint our user interface with that color. That makes it really useful to tell if you're in Play Mode. And the reason that's important is, let's say I was in Play Mode and I didn't realize it. And I started dragging in some things. So maybe I went into this stars thing and I grabbed this hyper giant star and I dragged it into our background. And I set its sorting layer to background and I set it at one. So it's going to render in front of the star field. And maybe, you know, I might have grabbed it and moved it around. You know, so, oh, that looks really cool. And who knows, maybe I might have added some more stuff. If I didn't realize I was in play mode and then I quit playing, all the changes I made while it was in play mode would go away. So it's really useful to be able to tweak things while you're in play mode, but you need to be aware that any changes you make will not be saved when you exit play mode. So in order to make sure you know you're in play mode, I use this play mode tent to color my user interface. That's a very useful tip. All right, so let's continue working on our background. We've got a star field. Let's uh, go and look at some of the other assets here. We got some planets. Maybe we'll drag uh, an Earth-like planet into the background. And we'll set it to the background layer and set it at two. And we'll drag this over Or maybe we'll leave it kind of centered in the view here. I kind of like that. I'm going to go back to those stars and grab a main sequence star. And I'm going to drag it up here above the Earth. Set it to background one. Oops. Make sure that I have the star selected. Kind of like that. So now in our field of view, we've got the planet sitting in front of a main sequence star. And maybe I'll make the star a little bit smaller so it looks like it's farther away. I kind of like that. So we're making good progress on our background here. I think that's enough for the background for now. And all we're doing right now is we're laying out the visual elements for our game. Uh, we'll get to scripting a little bit later. 
Uh, but first, I want to make sure we have a general idea of how the game's going to look. We're going to want to add a space station. So I'm going to again come here and say create empty. And we're going to call this Star Castle. Since that's the name of the game, and that's basically what this is. It's a star castle. I'm going to reset this to the center of the screen. And let's add some components to it. We're going to go down here and we're going to look at ships and stations. And I'm going to take this station two, which is this ring here, and I'm going to drag it onto that star castle. And we're going to create a new sorting layer. And you guessed it, we're going to call it foreground. And we're going to select that and we're going to assign it to the foreground layer. So now it displays in front of the background layer. And it looks a little bit small um, from what I'm looking for. Maybe I'll just make it about 50% bigger. That looks pretty good. And we're going to add a turret platform to it. So grab this turret platform and assign that to the station. And once again, set it to the foreground layer. And we'll make that appear in front of the station. Now you'll notice it's really small. If I zoom into my scene here, it's quite a bit smaller than the station. So to fix that, I'm going to go into its, oh, it's even scaled down. So I'm going to set it to a scale of one. That's still too small. Let's double that. That looks pretty good. And the game view here in particular, that looks nice. I like that. Now we're going to want to add a turret to that that will be able to rotate around and shoot at the player. So on top of the turret platform, we go down to turrets. And I think a turret large two might look nice. So if we take a look at that. It's got two guns on it, so to shoot two projectiles, I'm gonna drag that right on top of the turret platform. I'm gonna set it to the foreground and we're gonna make that order two. So it sits on top of the turret platform. I think I wanna make that bigger too. So let's set that to one. Yeah, so now if we were to rotate that, Go to its rotation and we're going to rotate on the Z axis. So you can see how that turret can rotate around and it will be shooting at the player. Go ahead and put that back to zero. The other thing I'd like to do is I would like our station to have some turrets on the ring out here that are just fixed position turrets. And we're going to use some single turrets for that. That looks pretty good. So I'm going to drag that. I'm going to drag it onto our scene. And we're going to set it to sorting layer foreground three. We're going to pick our move tool here. And we're going to position that. And I'm going to make it a little bit bigger. just so the barrel is protruding out beyond the end of the station. And that looks pretty good. And I'm gonna call this outer turret. Just for clarity. And I'm gonna make that part of the station. Okay, that still looks good. And I'm gonna duplicate that. And I'm gonna set this to zero and I'm going to set this to negative. Now what that did is it positioned it on the opposite end and then I'm going to rotate it 180 degrees. So we have a turret facing up, 
and a turret facing down. And I'm just going to rename that. And I'm going to duplicate both of these. I'm going to set it at Y0. Set them both at Y0 to start. And this one I'm going to move over here. I'm going to rotate it negative 90 degrees. So it's facing out. Okay, and then this one, I'm going to set it negative, and I'm going to rotate it 90 degrees. There. So he's got four fixed position turrets and a rotating turret. I think that's enough visual stuff for the station at this point. Let's go ahead and collapse that down. And we're going to want to create the visuals for our ship. So let's create an empty game object, call it player. And reset that. Let's go down here and look at ships. I was looking at these before and I think I like this frigate one. So I'm going to drag that onto our player object. And I'm going to set it to the foreground. I'm going to drag it over here. So it's over the star field. And I'm not really sure if I want to make that bigger or not. At any rate, I'm going to zoom into it here. And let's look at the turrets again. I think I kind of like that turret for the ship. Yeah, so I'm going to take this turret small one. I'm going to drag it onto our ship, set them to foreground. Actually, let me make sure he's a child of the frigate, reset his position, and just move him forward. There, so he's got a gun on the nose of a ship. And I'm just going to rename that turret. And I'm going to rename this player ship. Okay, so we want to rotate him negative or 90 degrees, so he's facing toward the station. That looks pretty good. Okay, now it's time to add some other components to our ship. We know that our ship, in addition to a sprite, is going to need a collider. And I think I'm going to use a polygon collider. If we were to edit that, well, you can see it displays the collider. So this will allow the ship to collide with enemy projectiles and also with the ring uh, segments that are going to be surrounding the station. Um, what else? We're going to want a rigid body, specifically a rigid body 2D since this is a 2D object. And see, mass looks good. I could probably play around with these. I know I'm going to want to have a little linear drag because of the way I'm going to move the ship. Um, I'm not sure if I'm going to worry about angular drag because I don't think I'm going to use torque to rotate the ship. We'll just leave that as it is. Gravity scale should be zero because it's in space. I think all of that looks good for the rigid body. Okay, it's time to create our first script. So with our player ship selected here, I'm going to go into our scripts folder. I'm going to right click, create C sharp script, and I'm going to rename this player ship. Select our ship and drag that as soon as Unity stops thinking. Okay. So now our player has a player ship script. Now I can double click it here 
or double click it here. If I just select it here, it will highlight it down here in the scripts folder. And I can double click here or I can double click here. Either one is going to open up the Visual Studio Editor uh, or whatever editor you've configured Unity to use. I'm using Visual Studio. And every script in Unity by default derives from this mono behavior class. And it's going to create two functions for you automatically. Start, which is called before the first frame update, and update, which is called once per frame. So if your game is running at 60 frames a second, this will get called 60 times. Now I'm going to actually rename this to Awake, because I know I'm going to want to do some work in Awake. Awake is another method that gets called when the script first is enabled. Let's see. Awake is called when the script instance is being loaded. So this will get called before start or any of the update methods are called. I'm going to delete this comment. We're going to want to add some serialized fields. So serialized fields are fields that will be visible and assignable in the inspector. So you add an attribute. So if you put something inside square brackets like this, this is an attribute. So this is the serialized field attribute and I'm applying it to a variable. So I know there's some things I'm going to want to have access to on my class. Uh, first of all, I want to have a rotation speed or maybe just speed. So this is going to be how much thrust I'm going to apply when you're pressing the thrust button. And I'm gonna give it a default value. I'm just making up something here, let's we'll say 30. And I'm also gonna to wanna to have a rotation speed. And I'll also make that 30, just, just to have the value in there. Um, I think that might be all I care about right now in terms of serialized fields. I'm gonna to wanna to add some other variables. We know that our ship has a rigid body. And we're going to want to have access to that because that's how we're going to move our ship forward. So I'm going to call that rigid body. And I like to cache my transform. So the transform is available on the game object, but it has to be boxed and unboxed from the underlying C++. Unity does cache it, but it still does boxing and unboxing. And you can have a little bit of a performance improvement if you cache it. So I'm going to cache it myself here. And in the awake method, I'm going to get both of these. So my rigid body, we'll say get component rigid body 2D. And in transform, I'm just going to grab directly off of this object. So I'm just going to say transform equals transform. Okay, so I've got access to those two variables. Now to explain what git component is doing, if we look at our player ship, you'll see that the script player ship is living on it. Let me um, get out of debug mode, put it in a normal mode, just to get rid of some of the confusing information. So. This script lives on the player ship game object. When you call get component from a script, it's going to look on the attached game object, which is this player ship for the component you're looking for. So get component rigid body 2D is going to look for and find this rigid body. So that's what we're doing there. Now, what we're going to want to do in update is we're going to want to get our rotation and our thrust. So I'm going to say get rotation and get thrust. And I'm going to go ahead and create these methods. Now, we've got our speed and our rotation speed, so that's good. But we're gonna wanna have something to store them in. So let's create a couple more variables. We're gonna want rotation amount. And thrust. And I'm gonna go ahead and create another variable and I'm gonna call it angle. And you'll see why in a minute. 
So in Get Thrust, I wanna look and see if we're pressing the buttons that will thrust forward. So in my game, I'm gonna use the N key. So if you look at your keyboard, on the bottom row, you got Z and X right next to each other, and you got N and M right next to each other. So in the arcade version of this game, you have <clears throat> uh, rotate left and right buttons for your left hand, and then you had on the right side a thrust and a fire button. And so I'm going to use the keyboard for that. I'm going to use Z and X to rotate left and right, and N and M to thrust and fire. So first, let's get our thrust. I'm going to say if input dot get key key code dot in, then we're thrusting. And so what are we going to want to do in get thrust? Well, what we're going to want to do is we're going to want to assign to our thrust variable our speed. So yeah, I think that's pretty simple. All we're doing, we're checking to see if this key is pressed, and if it is, we wanna assign that to our thrust. Otherwise, let's just set thrust to zero. So if you're not familiar with C-sharp, we're doing an if this condition is true, execute whatever's inside this statement here, these curly braces. So if we're pressing the end key, we're going to assign speed to our thrust variable. Otherwise, we're going to assign zero, so we're not thrusting. For the same way for rotation, if input.getKey, key code Z, this will be thrust left, then rotation amount will equal rotation speed. Else, so an else if says that that's not true, but this is. So else if we're pressing the X key, then we're going to rotate right. So let me change this to be rotate. So these are comments that's just making my code a little bit more readable. Now in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to say that a rotation amount equals a rotation speed times negative one. We're going to rotate the other direction. And then otherwise, if neither of those conditions is true, our rotation amount is zero. All right, so in update, which is called multiple times a second, called every frame, we're going to get our rotation and thrust. Now we need to apply it to our ship. And where do we want to do that? We want to do that in a function called fixed update. Now fixed update, if we look at the comment here, this function is called every fixed frame rate frame. So this is typically the place you want to do things that involve moving your object through physics which is exactly what we're doing. So first we want to handle our rotation. And I'm going to use a little built-in function called approximately. And what I'm doing is I'm going to compare our rotation amount to zero. If it's approximately zero, I don't want to rotate. But if it's not approximately zero, then I want to adjust our angle. So I'm gonna use this angle variable I created up there. And I'm initially gonna assign it to our current rotation using a built-in property on our transform called local Euler angle. So this is giving our rotation as Euler angle. So this is giving me an X, Y, Z rotation. And I only care about the Z axis because that's what we're rotating our ship around. If we jump back into Unity, and we select our player ship and we expand our transform, we look at rotation. If we rotate on the Z axis, you see our ship will, will rotate. So go back into code. The next thing we want to do is we want to apply our rotation amount to that angle. So I'm going to add 
So plus equal says basically it's the same as saying angle equals angle plus. So plus equal is just a shorthand way of saying So instead of doing that, I'm using shorthand to say plus equals. And I'm going to add our rotation amount. And I'm going to adjust it by something called time.fixed delta time. So we hover over that. IntelliSense tells us that the interval in seconds at which physics and other fixed frame rate updates are performed. <clears throat> so essentially, every time this gets called, this value will have the time in seconds since it was called previously. This will allow us to smooth our rotation and our movement out evenly, no matter how fast your processor is. So if you're running on a really fast computer or a really slow computer, it should perform the same. And finally, we're gonna assign that to our transforms rotation. And this rotation is a quaternion. <clears throat> And I'm not going to go into detail what quaternions are, but it's basically rotation around a point. <clears throat> I'm going to convert it to a quaternion using a built-in helper function called quaternion. Euler. So this is going to take our Euler angles, x, y, and z, <clears throat> convert it to a quaternion and assign it to our rotation. So let's just see if that works. We're going to save that. Go back into Unity. Okay, there we are. We have our speed, our rotation speed. I'm going to click play maximized, hit play. So there's our ship. And there we are, we're rotating. And we're rotating really slowly. So let me turn off Play Maximized. So I'll be able to mess with our inspector while we're doing this. And I'm just going to crank this up. Let's make it 60. Make it twice as fast. That still seems a little slow. Let's try it. I don't know why I'm messing with speed. Let me put that back to 30. <laughs> So rotation speed is now 80. That still seems slow. So let's make it 100. That seems a little snappier. Now, what did I tell you about if you change values in play mode? When I exit play mode, they go away. So let's go ahead and assign that back to 100. Now, let's go ahead and implement moving forward. Go jump back into our source code. So we've got our thrust here. So now we want to apply our thrust. So we'll do the same thing. We'll use that mathf.approximately zero. But this time we're going to compare it to thrust. So if our thrust is not zero, then we're going to use our rigid body you remember we grabbed our rigid body up here. Rigid body dot add force. And we're going to want to add it in a specific direction. So in a 2D game, we want to, if we want to go forward, what we want is transform dot up times thrust. And once again, we want to adjust this by time dot fixed delta time. Okay, save that. Jump back into our game. Into the Unity Editor. We'll go, well, I'll leave it unmaximized just so I can fiddle with it in case the speed is not to our liking. So I can rotate and I can thrust, but it's thrusting really slowly. So let's go ahead and crank that up to 100. That's still not very quick. Let's make it 300. Let's just be crazy. All right. 
I'm zipping along around the board. That looks pretty cool. And of course, there's no collision on the station right now, so all I can do is fly around. But we've got movement working. Hooray! So if I'm going to want to shoot projectiles, I'm going to need a projectile prefab. So we haven't really gotten into prefabs yet. So let's go ahead and go into our project folder here. And I did not create a prefab folder. So let's go ahead and do that. We'll go in there. And I'm going to go ahead and drag our player as a prefab. So we can always just spawn a player whenever we want. So now that it's there, saved as a prefab asset, I could delete the player from our scene and then I could just bring it back. And you see it's got all of its settings. Everything is, is still the same as what they were before we deleted it. So in the future, when we actually um, implement the gameplay for this, we're gonna have a player spawner or a game manager that will spawn the player at the start location every time the player ship is destroyed until he runs out of lives will spawn a new one and so forth so we have our player prefab and while we're at it we might as well create a station prefab let's go ahead and rename this to station actually I'm gonna rename it to star castle I'm going to create a prefab from that. Nice. Now, we're going to want a prefab for the projectile we're going to shoot. Now, in our 2D space kit, I was looking at some of the prefabs that it had, and I see there's one called Projectile Sharp, and I'm just going to drag that into our scene. And... I will look at its sprite render here. I'm gonna set it to foreground. Maybe I'll make it something like seven. I'm gonna drag it. Oops. It's got a trail renderer. That's pretty cool. But I am barely seeing that. It is tiny. So let's make that five times as big. That looks pretty good. I'm not sure I really like the color of it. That looks a lot better. Okay, so what else is on this guy? I'm going to rename this to be Player Projectile. And I'll go ahead and create prefab for it in our project I'm gonna create an original prefab all right so now it's totally separated from the original and we've got a sprite sprite looks fine it's got a box collider I don't think I want a box collider uh, that could work I think I'm gonna use a capsule collider oh it's got a trigger too so let's go ahead and remove that component and I'm going to add a capsule collider 2D and I'll set it to is trigger. that keep disappearing I think I like that I can actually make it a little bit smaller Okay, so we have our collider. It's got a trail renderer, which I think I might want to change the color of. It's 
it's got a script. I'm not sure I want their script. So I'm going to go ahead and remove component. Now whenever I make a change to an object that's from a prefab, it will show overrides. So basically I can keep my changes separate from the prefab or I could apply them to the prefab. It says I don't have any changes. Okay. Uh, let's see. Rigid body. So we will use rigid body to move this. We'll apply force to it. We're going to create our own script though. I'm going to call this player projectile. And I'm going to drag that onto our component. doing that script. Let's double click on it. Open it up in Visual Studio. Okay. I'm going to want some kind of a hit effect. We're going to want an audio clip. And I might play around with volumes later. I'm going to want a duration view. That's how long this projectile will last. So when you shoot it, it'll be around for five seconds by default. Uh, and in which case I will destroy it if it hadn't hit anything. I'm going to give this a range. So there's a parameter you can add to attributes called range. So I'll give it a value between 1 and 10. So if we go look at this in the inspector, we look at our player projectile script, we have game objects where we can add audio clips and hit sounds, and we have a duration slider that we can give a value between 5 and 10, or 1 and 10. Okay, what else do we want? I think we're going to want an update method. Lifetime. So actually, in on enable, when this thing is enabled, we're going to set its lifetime to be duration. And then, in the update method, we're going to decrement it by time dot delta time. And if that is less than or equal to 0f, we will destroy it. The other thing, since this collider on this guy was a trigger, we're going to add an on trigger enter 2D, in which case we're going to want to play a sound. We're going to want to play a hit animation effect. We're going to want to damage the object we hit. And we're going to want to destroy this game object. Now there's some things we have to do to get all of this stuff to work. First of all, in order for this trigger to work, we need to add some physics information. So this collider, as we mentioned, is a trigger, but we need to assign this guy to a layer. So right now, we need to add a layer for the player, for enemies, for player projectile, enemy projectile. So we're going to take this guy and we're going to set it to the player projectile layer. So 
what that means is we go into our project settings and we look at physics 2d this shows the collision matrix for 2D physics objects. So right now, enemy projectile will collide with everything. We only want enemy projectiles to collide with the player. We want player projectiles to collide with enemies. We want enemies to collide with the player. And that's probably good for right now. Just leave all that as it is. Okay, so a player projectile will collide with an enemy. Right now we don't really have an enemy, but we will be able to launch a projectile, but we need to add a script to our turret. So let's go into our scripts here, create a C-sharp script. Player turret. Well, one thing I'm going to want to do on our turret is I want to add a barrel to it or a muzzle. So I'm going to create an empty game object and call it muzzle. And I'm going to move it to the front of the turret. And that's going to be where we will launch our projectile from. So let's go ahead and open up our player turret script. Add a serialized field, game object, muzzle. We're going to add a serialized field, game object for projectile prefab. And so in here, we're going to say if input get key. M is our fire key. But we're going to want to also have a cooldown. We don't want to just be able to fire as fast as we can. And we'll say it's going to be about a quarter of a second. I want to apply, but based on how much it took to move that ship, I think I'll go with a value of 500. That looks good. Okay, so I'm going to add a Boolean can fire using expression body method. And basically, this will say fire delay is less than or equal. Actually, I'm not going to use an expression body method because I want to decrement it. So 
So if you can fire and you press the key, fire projectile. So in fire projectile, we'll reset our fire delay to be our cooldown. And we'll instantiate a projectile from our prefab at our barrel position. Oh, that's one thing. Muzzle position. And using our current rotation. which I need to cache our transform. Okay, so we instantiate that. Now we're gonna to want to get our rigid body for the projectile, add force, again, if you want to move forward in a 2D game, you want to apply it to transform up, and play firing sound. We go back to our game, and look at our turret, go ahead and apply that. So we want our muzzle, we want our projectile prefab, we want our firing sound, which I think that was going to be in our laser sounds. I guess this is as good a time as any to look at some of those. Was loud. Let's see. Set it to auto play. Ooh, I like that. Night blast fly. So we'll go up to the turret. Drag that in. Of course, we're not playing any sounds now. What we can do is we can add an audio source. You know what? I can get rid of that. Do it this way. Say play on awake. We don't want to loot. We will disable that. Go back into our script, get rid of this, make it an audio source. No, I don't want to do it that way. It's easier. Well, I'll do both. So what I can do is say audio source that play one shot audio or firing sound. Go back into our editor. So we will drag our audio source into here. Okay, what happens if we hit play? hearing the sound. Oh, I disabled our audio source. 
So let's fix this. Audio source enabled. Go ahead and get rid of the audio clip. We don't want play on awake. Hit play. All right, we've got it firing. Okay, so the player ship can fly around and it can shoot. It'd be nice if we had something to shoot at. So let's go back and look at our star castle. Right now, our star castle does not have a collider. So let's go ahead and add a component and make it a circle collider 2D. Oops. Oh, perfect. Yes, that's perfect. And we're going to want to put that on the enemy layer. Sure. Okay. So we want a script for the star castle. Let's go into our scripts. Create. Drag it onto our star castle. Double click that and let's add an on collision enter 2D. Now we already know from our physics, from our preferences, actually our player settings, project settings, that the enemy will collide with the player and player projectiles. So, we don't have to worry about anything else colliding with it because the only thing the physics engine will allow to collide with it is the player or the player projectile. So, just to test that this is working, we will do a debug.log um, Star castle hit by. If you put a little dollar sign in front of a string, it, it, it lets you do what's called string interpolation. You can put something in curly braces here, and I can say collision dot collider dot name. There. So now if we go back into our game. hit play hmm it did not collide with it oh I know why it's because the projectile is set to be a trigger if we if we go and look at our player projectile prefab and we look at its collider, is trigger is true. So let's see what happens if we say on trigger inner 2D. There it is. Okay, so we can handle being hit. Now, there's another way to do this though. I can handle it that way, 
or I could create a class called damageable and I could add it to the star castle. Yeah, I'm going to do it that way. Let's create a script. I'm going to call it damageable. I'm going to add that to the star castle. And we're going to want to add some variables to it. I think all I want to do is have a function called take damage. It'll be a public function. And we can use this. Let's see, we can even have a serialized field max health actually make that an integer and then Health equals max health. Take damage. We can say health minus equals damage. And say if health is less than or equal to zero. destroy me so we can also have a prefab for explosion prefab we can have Explosion sound. I'm not going to use a serialized field. Audio source. Destroy me, we can play the explosion sound. We can instantiate the explosion prefab at our transformed out position, and we don't care about the Rotation, so we can use something called quaternion identity. That's, that's where we'll spawn an explosion at that location. And we can destroy the game object. Okay, so now we want to go look at our projectile. And I think we want to add another serialized field which is the amount of damage it will deal. And I'm gonna just set that to one to start with. So now, when it hits, we want to get component or collision game object dot get component damageable. take damage, damage. So this should get the damageable component on whatever it is we hit and deal our damage to it. 
take a look at our star castle. We got our damageable script. Um, we're going to want to add an audio source. We're going to want max health to be one. That's fine. An explosion prefab. Are there any explosions? There is. Let's see what that looks like. Explosion sound. Let's go look at our. I don't think there's any explosions we can use. Well, maybe there is. Let's see. Like any of those so we did in our sounds here have that. so let's do that I have no idea what this explosion looks like but let's see what happens when I shoot the star castle <laughs> well that was interesting I did not hear a sound effect but it did disappear. Let's go back into our code. Should have heard that. Oh, I know why. I know why. We're destroying the object before we can ever hear, hear that. And I'm gonna have to edit this explosion prefab to make sure it shows up in front of everything else, it probably did spawn. So I'm gonna do this a little bit differently. Forget this audio source. I'm gonna do something I probably should have done from the beginning. I mentioned in the beginning that I was gonna add some stuff to this system here. So let's go ahead and create an empty game object and call it Sound Manager. Create a script. Let's drag that onto there. What does it not like? Oh. Okay. And we're going to do something interesting here. We're going to use a singleton pattern. So I'm going to say public static sound manager instance. And then in the awake method, I'm going to say if instance not equal to this instance equals this don't destroy unload game object else destroy this and I'm going to use the instance to our Play sound. I'm going to have public void play sound effect. Audio clip, clip, and I'll give it a volume. Default it to one. This is going to have an audio source.
sound manager dot play. Oh, instance. Play sound effect. Explosion sound. There's another thing you can go into your project settings. Script execution order. We will add the sound manager and we want it to come in front of damageable. This will make sure that sound manager is instantiated before we try to access it from our damageable. Hmm, we did not. We had a null reference exception. Oh, I did not add an audio source. Okay, so we got, let's see if we see an explosion show up here. Yes, we saw an explosion briefly. So let's go look at that explosion prefab. Uh, let's see. Go into the renderer, sorting layer, foreground, and we'll make it 10. Wasn't much of an explosion, but it works. Make this maximize on play just so we can see that happen. Okay, so what is next? I think we need to add the shields to our Star Castle. That's really what makes the Star Castle game Star Castle, anyway. So let me just apply our overrides. our overrides and so we are going to want to add a shield object so I'm going to create an empty game object I'm going to call it shield go up to our scripts folder okay, so Okay, so we create the shield script. We're gonna to wanna to drag it onto the shield game object. And then double click to open that up in the editor. And this is going to be the most complicated part of the whole game. So before we actually edit the script, I want to go into the editor. I'm going to create a new game object called Ring Segment. Actually, instead of creating a game object, I'm going to create a cube. I know this is a 2D game, but I'm going to use a cube for my ring segments. It's going to have a mesh renderer in a box collider. These are things I'm already, I already know for a fact I'm going to need. So is there anything else I need? I'm gonna to wanna to add a sorting group. Set that to foreground. Probably six would be good for the order in layer. And I'm gonna want a material. So right now we have a default material, but I'm gonna create a new material. So come in here to my materials folder that we had created, create material, and we wanna use a legacy shader, transparent, cutout, 
soft edge unlit. And I'm gonna give it a base color of green. And I'm gonna rename this to ring material. I'm gonna pick our ring segment and drag that ring material onto there. So now, you see I got this beautiful little green square. And we're gonna make that a prefab. does our ring segment need? I think we're gonna want a script. So let's go up to our scripts folder. Ring segment. If I go into our prefab, double click that, I can drag our ring segment script onto it. So what do we want in that script? I'm gonna want some serialized fields. I do wanna have a number of points that you get awarded when you destroy a segment. I'm going to extract an interface. Come over here to ring segment. And I'm gonna have it implement that interface. And then I'm gonna make my projectile grab the interface. So when I get this, I'm going to want to tell Game Manager, which doesn't exist yet, to add points. And I'm going to want to dis deactivate this ring segment. I know I'm moving kind of fast here, but let's see. I want to assign some values to my projectile. Uh, let's see, prefab. So I want to hit effect and I want to hit sound. So for hit effect, I'm going to use our explosion again. For hit sound, Two. All right. All right, so now let's work on our ring segment here. That looks good. So now we want to work on creating those rings in the shield script. So this is going to be the most complicated script 
in the whole game. So let's go ahead and clear this all out for now. We're going to want a number of serialized fields. Uh, but first I want to create a class. I'm going to put the serializable attribute on it so that this can show up in the inspector. And I'm going to call this ring definition. And I'm going to have three public fields. I'm going to have a radius field. This is going to be how wide the, how big around the ring is. This is going to be the ring of the shield that's outside the space station. Uh, I'm going to have the number of segments in the shield. It's going to be a segmented shield. And it's going to each, it's going to be three concentric rings of shields. And they're each going to have their own color. I'm going to call that ring color. All right. I'm also going to want to have a segment definition. And let's see, I want to have it overlap some amount with adjacent segments so there's no weird looking gaps between them. They're going to have a certain thickness. If I can type. And they're going to have a height. And move them out into their own files. All right, so now our serialized fields. I want to have a list of ring definitions. And I'm going to want to have our segment prefab. To build the rings from. And then the values we're going to populate those segment definitions with. So our overlap Give it a default value. Our thickness. Our height. We want to have the rate the base rate at which we're going to rotate and then extra rotation to apply to segments farther out. Okay. So let's declare some private variables in here. We want to have a, this is weird, a array of a list of rings. So basically, a, an array of lists of game objects. So an array of rings where each ring is a list of game objects. That makes sense. And I want to cache our transforms for our rings. I want to keep track of our star castle itself. And then I'm going to use a variable called age to determine how much the ring should be rotated. I want a flag to say whether or not we are spinning or not. I'm going to do something interesting here for the start method. I'm going to make it an I enumerator which basically makes it a coroutine. And in order for this to behave as a coroutine, I'm going to have to do a yield return 
Um, so I'm going to say while true, so I'm going to loop forever, yield return null. That gets rid of that little error that we had there. So the first thing I want to do in here is create our rooms. And then in here, we're going to spin the rings. Create rings. What do we want to do in here? First thing I want to do is if we already have rings, I just want to return. I want to set spinning to false. I want to instantiate our ring definitions. And then I want to iterate through each of them. So I'm populating our collection of rings here. And I want to instantiate a cube definite, um, a segment definition. And I'm going to use something called an object initializer. So instead of instantiating this and then setting the properties after the fact, I'm going to initialize them all inside of this instantiation. So I'm going to set the overlap to be our overlap value. I'm going to set our thickness. Oops. These should be commas, not semicolons. Thickness and height. OK, I'm going to want to create the ring segments and assign that to our castle. And now for the most complicated part of the entire game. So first of all, if we already have a collection of ring transforms and there are children in it, I want to deparent every transform in it. So for each transform, transform in transforms. So I'm going to iterate through that collection of ring transforms and for each one set its parent to be null. And then I want to clear that collection. Okay. Right. And at the end of this I'm going to return our game object. Just really a little red squiggly. All right, let's create a new collection of ring transforms. And a new collection of rings. And we want to set this array to be the length. I think that looks right. 
Okay, four int i equals zero. I'm gonna loop through each ring, or each ring definition, which is essentially the same thing. And I'm going to instantiate a new list of game objects. So each ring will have its own list of game objects. And save off for shorthand our ring definition. We want to calculate the circumference of our ring. So that's going to be the ring radius times 2 times math f dot pi. That's our simple geometry to calculate the circumference of our ring. And now we want to get the segment length of each individual segment, and that's really simple. We just take the circumference and divide it by the number of segments. I can spell. There we go. And then we want to adjust that by our overlap. Okay. We want to instantiate a new ring parent for this ring. Now I want to have a name for these guys, so let me go into our ring definition and give this a name. Okay, so I'm instantiating a new game object for that ring name and getting its transform and assigning it to this ring parent. And I'm going to add that to our collection of ring transforms. parent that to us. Okay, now let's loop through all of our ring segments and create the individual segments. So we've calculated the angle at which we're going to throw this guy out. We want to determine its rotation now. We're going to again convert from Euler's to quaternion using the angle we just calculated. Okay, now what do I want to call this? I'm going to call it segment game object. And this is where we instantiate our prefab. We're going to get its renderer. And we're going to get its material and its color. And we're going to set it to the ring color. And We're going to get the ring segment component off of it. Actually, I don't think I've added that yet. That's something I'm going to do in the future. So I'm going to comment that out. 
Okay, now. Child that to the ring parent. And we want to scale it appropriately. So we've scaled it based on our length, thickness, and height. Okay. And we want to calculate its position. So again, we're going to take vector 3 up and multiply that times the radius of the ring. And we're going to set its position rotating it around our axis. So now let's assign it all. Segment geo dot transform dot position equals segment position local rotation equals rotation finally add this I think if we did everything right that should create our concentric rings. Now there's a lot more work to do. Let's go to our star castle. Okay, segment prefab. Ring segment. We need to add our ring definition. So I want to have three rings. Radius, we'll say, let's say three, 10 segments. Make this one red. Okay. Oops. Actually, I want this one to be ring one. Actually, let me just move that up. Ring two, four, 12 segments. We'll make him green. Radius of five, 16 segments, and we'll make that one yellow. Okay, let me look at that. Let's see what happens. Woohoo! We got our rings red, green, and yellow. I'm amazed that worked. First try. Okay. Let's go back into our shield. And we're going to want to implement the rotate rings, spin rings. If spinning, actually, I'm going to say if not spinning, this is called a guard statement where you check for a false condition and you just return. This keeps you from having things being nested. Because if I had said, if spinning, then I would have had to create a body here and now I would be indented. 
but I can add a guard statement, check for the false condition, and then just return. It keeps things from being too indented. I'm going to increment our age by multiplying it by time dot delta time, or adding time dot delta time. Now, we know that our children are all rotatable. Basically, we have a bunch of ch children who are rings. So I'm going to iterate through all the children of our star castle transform. We want to calculate our pivot. So we're going to take the transform at that position. And we're going to calculate an angle from it. We're going to take our rate of rotation base. We're going to add to it any extra rotation multiplied times which ring we're on. So ring zero, there's no multiplication. Ring one will add one times the extra rotation. Ring two will add double the extra rotation. Okay, let's see. We want to multiply that by the age. And then what we want to do is we want to make sure that every other ring to rotate in the opposite direction. So the way we'll do that is we'll take our angle, whatever we calculate it. We'll see if we're odd or even. And then either use negative one or one times that. And finally, we will set the rotation of that ring Again, converting from Euler angles to a quaternion on the e on the z-axis. Let's go back and hit play. And nothing is rotating. Interesting. Oh, I never set spinning to true, did I? So we create the rings. And there we go. Ooh, they're spinning fast. I'm not sure I like that. Let's go to play focused. I think I have too much extra rotation. Yeah, I like that better. So one thing I can do, I'm in play mode. I'm going to lose my changes. I can come over here and I can say copy component, exit play mode, and then say paste component values. And there, the changes I made are now applied back to that. hit play. We got our rotating shields. Now the shields need to be on a layer. On the, the ring segments need to be on a layer, a physics layer. And they're currently on default. Let me put them on enemy. I'm probably going to change that to be ring 
because I want the player ship to bounce off. They did not hit the shield. Why didn't they hit the shield? Ring segment, layer enemy. I damageable, take damage. doesn't say what it's hit by. So the ring segments are not registering. You know, I think I do want to add a rigid body. Oh, I see the problem. This is a box collider. I want to add a box collider 2D. And I'm going to go ahead and change the layer here. That should fix that. I'm not real happy with those sounds, but you can always replace them with whatever sound you like. I want to add a rigid body. And let's look at the settings on this. No gravity. And I'm going to want to create a physics material. Physics material 2D. And I want to give it some bounciness. Go over to our ring segment. Drag that on. Hit play. And I'm not bouncing. Okay, I figured out why I wasn't bouncing. I'm pretty sure my player ship needs to be on the player level, the player layer. All right. So you bounce off the shields.
but it wasn't bouncy. All right, let's try it again. Boing! <laughs> I think it's time to get the turret on the star castle to follow our player and eventually shoot at him. So if we go up to our star castle and you see we've got our turret large here. I'm just going to rename that turret. And I want to create a new script. And I will call this enemy turret. And I'm going to drag that onto the turret. And let's open that up in Unity. Now, if we want that to follow the player, we're going to have to have a target. So let's create a transform variable. And we'll call this target. And we're going to want to have a rotate speed. And I want to be able to adjust this in the inspector. And I'm going to give it a range of maybe three, zero to three seconds. I think that'll work. And we'll call that a float. Rotate speed. And we'll default it to half a second. And we're probably going to want to have an initial delay before it can fire. I'll also make that a range from zero to five seconds. Give the player some time to fly around and shoot before he gets shot back at. We'll start that at five seconds. And I want to have the shoot force that he will apply to the projectile when he launches it. I don't really know how much I want that to be, but we'll give it some value right there. All right, so when we get to the awake method, we're gonna wanna grab our target. Actually, we don't wanna do that in awake. Let's go ahead and do that and start. And so the target, we will say, mm, find object of type player ship and I think I want to use the parameter to say include inactive just in case the player ship is not active and then we're going to get his transform okay so we what we want to do is we want to have the turret rotate to face the target so let's come in here have a vector 3 vector to target. We're going to take the target's position and subtract our position. And then we're going to convert that to an angle. And there's a built in mathf function ATN2. And we only care about the X and Y. And we're gonna convert that from radians to degrees. And then I think because of the direction that the station is facing initially, I'm gonna to have to subtract 90 degrees from it to get it to actually point at the player. And let's convert this to a quaternion since we know that Unity likes to use quaternions for our rotations. And we're going to do that on our forward axis, which is the Z axis in this case. 
Okay, what do we want to do now? We want to actually apply that to our transform rotation, but we don't want to apply it all at once. We want this to be kind of smooth. So we're going to use a built-in function called slurp. So as you can see, slurp spherically interpolates between quaternions A and B by a ratio. So we're going to use slurp. We're going to take our current rotation, rotate to our destination rotation, And then we want to make our ratio be time dot delta time times our rotate speed. Now, let's jump back into Unity. Oh, there we go. So you see the turret has rotated around to face the player. And as the player flies around, the turret is rotating the following. I think I might want to increase that rotate speed a little bit. Yeah, that looks pretty darn good. If I pop out the other side, it's got to swing all the way around to try and find me. Pretty nice. Okay. So we've got the turret rotating to face the player. That all works honky-dory. Now we want to have it shoot at the player. We're going to have to create a new prefab. I want to take our projectile, player projectile prefab, and I want to unpack this completely so it's no longer a prefab. I want to rename this enemy projectile. And let's come in here and look at our sprite renderer and let's change our color from yellow to maybe like a bright green. I think something like that looks pretty good. And I think we're also going to want to go into our trail renderer. Maybe something like that. All right, that looks pretty good to me. And is there anything else? Let's see, is it tagged? Yes, so I want to put this in the enemy projectile layer. I think that's fine. Actually, let me add a, a new tag here. Enemy projectile. Come back in here and select that. And the script, we want to get rid of that. We're going to want to create a new script. And we will attach that to the enemy projectile. And right now the enemy projectile script won't do anything. I'm going to drag this down to our prefabs. And I'm going to delete it from here. So if we go back into our enemy turret script. We're going to want to add a prefab for projectile. And we've got our initial delay, so let's do something with that. We're going to have a variable called cooldown. And on enable, we're going to say cooldown equals initial delay. 
And then we're going to add a variable here called kinfire. And all it's going to do is say cooldown is less than or equal to zero. Actually, instead of being an expression body method, I'm going to use a block body for the property. And I'm going to say that cooldown minus equals time dot delta time. So down here in update, I'm going to say if can fire fire projectile. So can fire will decrement our cooldown. If it's less than or equal to zero, it will return true. Otherwise, it will return false. If we can fire, we're going to call fire projectile. You know, we're also going to want, we're going to want an audio clip fire sound. Okay. Now, what do we want to do in fire projectile? The first thing we're going to want to do is reset our cooldown delay. And then we're going to want to get the position of our muzzle. You know, I don't think that we added a muzzle to this turret. We did not. So let's go ahead and create an empty game object. Call it muzzle. I just realized there's multiple muzzles on this guy. But for now, we'll just keep it simple and we'll fire a single bullet out of here. Okay, I like that. All right, is there anything else that we need in there? Let's go back into our script. We'll say that our projectile will be an instantiation of our projectile prefab at the muzzle. Oh, we need a reference to our muzzle. script because I didn't complete that function. And we'll use our current pos uh, rotation. go back into our Unity Editor, pick our turret, drag our muzzle, and we're going to drag our enemy projectile, and we want a fire sound. That'll work. Okay, let's go back into that script. Um, let's see. So we're instantiating it. Now we need to apply force to it. So let's say projectile dot get component rigid body 2d dot add force transform dot up 
times shoot force. And we'll have our sound manager dot instance dot play sound effect fire sound. Let's see what that does. Go back into Unity. Click play. Turret rotates around. Nice. And of course, it's not going to do anything if it hits me. I think I need to make the rotation speed a little bit faster. Make it one. You know, I had adjusted it in play mode and didn't save my changes. at our player ship and we need to add the eye damageable interface to that oh no I need to go into my player ship script and add the eye damageable interface here Need to implement that interface. And say, do we have an ex explosion effect? Why did I call that a null? That needs to be a game object. Actually, I'm going to call that explosion prefab. And I'm going to have an audio clip. Explosion sound. Okay, so if I take damage, then I want to play the explosion sound. I want to instantiate the explosion prefab at our position and I don't care about rotation so we will use quaternion identity and then I want to destroy game object. Now, ultimately we're going to be creating a game manager and we're going to tell the game manager hey our player ship was destroyed and he will decrement the number of lives and if we have any lives left he will spawn a new ship and if we don't he will display the game over screen but for now all we want to do is destroy the ship to show that we've been hit now we got to go into our enemy projectile script because it's currently not doing anything and let me look at the player projectile script real quick. So we have on trigger enter. So we want to do basically the same thing here. In fact, do I really even need a separate script? I don't think I do. But I'm just going to go ahead and copy this. This is bad practice. Don't try this at home. No, seriously, I probably don't need separate scripts for this. So let's go back into this. 
Go into our prefab. Oh, that's the 2D space kit prefabs. Enemy projectile. Okay, so we want a hit effect and a hit sound. Duration out looks good. Damage looks good. Let's see, what do we want for a hit effect? What are we using for the player projectile? Explosion. And then Light Blast 2. All right, let's see what this does. Well, something's missing. Did I not assign my explosion prefab to the player ship? I did not. Explosion sound. All right. Click play. Wait for him to shoot me. exception probably because I destroyed the ship and now the station is trying to track the ship that's exactly what's going on okay well I think that's a good good progress we've got the space station tracking the ship shooting at the ship it can destroy the ship um, next we'll start working on some of the game logic okay so the next thing I'm gonna want to do is I'm gonna want to implement the exhaust for the engines on this player ship. I want to have uh, some visual indication that the player is thrusting the engines. And I also want to play the thrusting sound that we had downloaded. Uh, but first, let's go look at the sample scene that came with this 2D space kit. So if we open up that scene, you can see there is a fighter ship, the, the same sprite that we're using in our game. And if we look in the hierarchy here we look at this player there's an engine game object which has a trail renderer that uses a smoke trail material and it's got a child component that's a particle system and let's zoom in here a little bit you can see that that particle system is displaying that that engine glow there and then the smoke trail will leave a little trail behind the ship when it flies. So we want to add that effect to our game. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this engine game object, I'm gonna go up to our prefabs folder, and I'm just gonna drag that in there to create a prefab. And I'm gonna rename this to exhaust, or engine exhaust. And let's go back to our scene don't want to save any changes we made there now let's look at our prefab we want to add another component well first we need to fix some things so we look at this trail renderer the sorting layer is default we want to make that foreground and I remember that the player ship sprite was order layer 5 so we're gonna make this 4 so it's just underneath of the ship and we need to do the same thing if we expand this prefab here and we look at its child, this particle system. We need to go down to the renderer. And we want to set the renderer for the particle system foreground four. There, that should do that. Now if we go back to our player, to our player ship, we want to add this engine exhaust as a child of the player ship. Uh, the other thing we want to do is we want to add a component. 
we want to add an audio source and then we want to drag in our jetpack sound we want it to play on awake and we want it to loop and if we go back to our player ship let's go ahead and apply our prefab we're going to want to edit the script And let's add a serialized field. It's going to be a game object, and it's going to be our engine exhaust. And then we have update where we're getting our thrust, and we have fixed update where we're applying the thrust. Let's add a late update. So late update is called every frame, and it's going to get called after update and fixed update. And this is a good place to update um, visual things. So after we've already moved and engaged our thrust and all that, this is where we want to update something on the graphics. So we're going to say that our engine exhaust, what is it called? Engine exhaust set active is going to equal thrust is greater than zero so we're only going to turn that engine on that engine exhaust on if we are thrusting so let's go back in here we've got play maximize let's hit play and see what happens so something is obviously wrong because the engine is on but we are seeing the the engine effect Fail render, and we're hearing the sound. We're just oh, I know exactly what's wrong. We probably haven't accept. Yep, unassigned reference. Uh, you all probably saw that, and you were probably yelling at the at the screen. I did not set this. So what we want to do is we want to take our engine exhaust and drag it into that serialized field there, and go ahead and apply our override to the prefab. Hit play. Ah, we are not thrusting. We are. I like it. All right. Okay, I think it's finally time to start adding some rudimentary game state and some UI to our game. Uh, if I'm going to have game state, I'm going to put it in a game manager. So first I'm going to create a container, uh, empty game object for the game manager. And I'm going to call this man, actually I'm going to call it managers. And underneath of that, I'm going to create a game manager. And I'm actually gonna move in my sound manager into the, ooh, I just realized something. So I made a mistake earlier. I don't know if any of you all noticed it. My sound manager, if you recall, is a singleton. And I called don't destroy on load on it. And that in and of itself is not a problem. However, don't destroy on load only works for root level game objects and I have put sound manager under this system game object so it won't do anything and I can prove that if I hit play and after the game starts I pause the game we should see a don't destroy on load object here in our hierarchy and under that the sound manager and we don't because I put the sound manager under that system if I was to move it out just at the root level here and hit play there we have don't destroy on load and sound manager so I can fix that by putting the don't destroy on load on this object uh, and then taking it off of this object I'm gonna go ahead and do that before I forget now I could just add a script to this and then um, call that don't destroy and load and implement the singleton pattern on that. But I don't really want to do that. For one thing, I want, what if I want these managers to be available across scenes? I would have to 
basically put this on every scene. Um, so there's another way I can handle that. Before I forget, let me go ahead and add a music manager. And I'm going to create some scripts for these objects. So I'm going to call this a managers folder. I'm going to move that sound manager script into the managers folder. I'm going to go in there and I'm going to create a game manager for Unity. Game manager and music manager. So I'm going to drag the game manager up here and I'm going to grab the music manager and drag it up here. Now like I said I could put a script on this but I saw that there's another way to do this that is a lot simpler and let me go ahead and reset this guy's transform position. These don't really matter, but I just like to have everything at the world origin. What I can do is I can make a prefab from this. Tarot Dev, who's another YouTube, um, he's got a very popular following. Um, he does Unity game development tutorials. He recently did a video on this. And what he did is he created a resources folder. And then he dragged his manager's object into there to create a prefab. And then he deleted this from his scene. And if I go back into my manager's script folder and create a new script, and I'll call this load persistent objects. And I'm gonna open that up in Visual Studio. Now I'm going to, I'm not going to do exactly what he did, but I'm going to do very, very close to exactly what he did. Um, this is not going to be a mono behavior. It's going to be a public static class. And it's going to have a single method, which is also going to be static, and it's going to be execute. And I want to add an attribute to it. This attribute is what does the magic. It is runtime initialize on load method. And the type is going to be before scene load. So before a scene loads, it's going to call this method and execute it. And so the first thing I want to do is I want to load that manager's resource. And then if that's not null, I want to instantiate it and call don't destroy unload on it. So I will say object don't destroy unload object dot instantiate resource. So if I go back into Unity and let all those scripts load and compile, you see I have no manager's object here. There's no don't destroy unload object. If I hit play, ta-da. So we have don't destroy unload, we have managers, and under managers we've got our game manager, sound manager, and music manager. And that will automatically load regardless of what scene we're in. So for instance, I'll save this scene. I'll go out to our scenes folder and I will create a scene and I will call this title scene. And if I open that scene up, it gives me a main camera, that's nice. I will make that a black background. And we will add a UI element, UI panel. Actually, I don't need a panel. I'm just going to add a text object. And because this is the first time I've added a text mesh pro object, I'm going to have to import the text mesh pro essentials. 
you can see it created a little text element there it says new text and I'm going to call this star castle and I'm going to increase the font size this make it something really big and you can see how it wrapped so we're going to do a few things we're going to make it centered we're going to disable wrapping I like it uh, I think I do want to move it up a little bit And then I want to add, let me change that its name. Oh, and I also want to anchor it. So let me move it back up again. So it's now anchored to the center of the screen. Oh, another important point. When I first added that element, you'll notice that it created a canvas. Well, that canvas by default is set to a constant pixel size and that is not what we want because we want this to scale based on the actual screen size so you go down here and say scale with screen size uh, and then you see this reference resolution well we're designing our game for 1920 by 1280 so let's use that as our reference resolution make sure that took okay so now even if this display was to change size that text is going to scale and position itself accordingly uh, so let's add another UI element another text element actually we don't want a text element let's delete that let's add a button there we go button and I'll call this play button I will anchor it to the center of the screen and I want that to be quite a bit bigger so we'll set its scale to be three by three I like that and we go into the text portion of the button we'll call that play now ultimately when we click play if we go up to the button here on this on click event um, I'm gonna call a method that will call start playing on the or actually it will load the main scene so let me go ahead and on this canvas here it's probably as good a place as any I'm going to go into our scripts and I'm going to create a folder and I'm going to call this title screen so any scripts that are related to the title screen will go in here. I'm going to create a new C sharp script title screen UI. And I'm going to drag that onto this canvas. So I'm going to go ahead and collapse all these things. Open that up. Get rid of all this stuff. And I'm going to create a public void method play button clicked and this is going to call load main scene and I need to use the scene management and in here I will say scene manager dot load scene main scene back into unity go to our button under on click I'll click the plus button I will drag in our canvas which has that script on it and then I will select title screen UI play button clicked I'm gonna close this window here so now we need to go into our build settings. Um, play settings. Oh, actually, we got it here. Scenes, scenes, and build. So right now, the only scenes we have in our build are the main scene. So we want to go into our scenes folder, grab the title scene, and drag that in. And we actually want to move that up above the main scene. So that'll be the first scene to load. And if I click play, you see we are on our main scene. If I click play, 
reload the game scene. All right, so now you have seen the basics of how to create multiple scenes, how to switch between them. We have some basic uh, game management going on here. Um, maybe it's time to add music. So you remember we downloaded some music tracks. I think I like this one for the game. Uh, what would make a good menu uh, music? Okay, I kind of like that for the title screen. And then we've got this for the main game scene. Looking for something for the game over scene. That's kind of somber. Nah. <laughs> no. Maybe this one for the game over. It doesn't really matter. It's just to get the point across. So let's go into our managers. Go into music manager. And let's create a serialized field. And we want an array or a list of audio clips. And this will be music clips. And let's create an enumeration. And we're gonna have music tracks. And we're gonna have title music, play music, game over music and maybe we'll have a none so this would be negative one so these are basically you can even define this if you want but by default these are integers but they're just represented by these little IDs here I'll make this one zero and then it would automatically populate these in order but I'll just go ahead and specify those and those will be indexes into our array here and then we will have a public play music music tracks music track and we will say we'll do a switch statement we'll say switch music track and if it is none oh one very important thing we need an audio source and we can actually um, we can go out and create one on the component but we could also add a required component type of audio source and this should guarantee that it creates an audio source if we didn't add one in our await method we'll get that component okay so what we're going to want to do here is say audio source dot stop otherwise we will do some if in here we'll say if well we should really check to make sure that our index is within bounds so we'll say index equals int music track this will convert it from an integer I mean from an enum to an integer we'll say if index is greater than or equal to zero and index is less than music clips you know what Did I type and what language do I think I'm using here So, if index is greater than equal to zero and index is less than 
the count, then we will say audio source dot play music clips oh play oh we want to set the audio clip clip equals music clips index I was getting confused with play one shot where you actually pass in an audio clip. Okay, so we set the clip and then we tell it to play. There, so now we have a public method on our music manager to play a specific music track. Now we're gonna wanna make this a singleton and in our awake method we will say if instance is not equal to null and instance is not equal to this delete game object or destroy game object else instance equals this so this is our singleton pattern we will make sure that the first time we come in here we will save off this instance and then we'll always only use this instance if we come in here again for instance when we change scenes if it tries to create a new music manager we'll just destroy it immediately So let's go back to our title. Go to our title screen and in start, we will say music manager dot instance dot Did I not make that a static? I did not. Okay, dot play music, title music. Okay, let's go into our Unity editor. Let's double click on our music manager to open up the prefab. Ah, I gotta double click my manager's resource. Where is that? Resources, resources. Okay. All right, I wanna expand the music manager. And here under music clips, I wanna drag in our music clips. So, if you remember in our music manager, we defined our enum to be title music, play music, game over music. So we wanna grab our title music. I'm gonna lock this inspector here. Go to our music tracks. And I think I said that I liked this one for the title. Oh, it's locked, so it's not gonna play it. Yeah. So let's drag that into the first one. And then I know I wanted to do Zephyr for the play music. And then I think I said Stupid Dancer for the game over music. Now when we play, it should start playing that music automatically. Loverly. Okay, so now in the game manager, this is where we're going to actually start adding some state. And 
And once again, we're gonna use the singleton instance. So we're gonna go public, static, instance, game manager. That is weird. Got to put things in the right order, Greg. Okay, so in on awake, I think, can I just copy this code? Pretty generic. Alrighty. So I have that. I could actually make a base class for that. Anyway, so we've got our instance, singleton instance set up. So in start, we're going to want to get our music. We're going to call the music manager and tell it to play nothing because initially we're gonna be in countdown mode. So let's go ahead and define our states. I should probably do that before I do anything else in here. So let's create an enumeration and we'll call it game states. And we're gonna have get ready. We're gonna have playing. And I think I want to have separate states for player ship destroyed and star castle destroyed. And then I want to create a private variable. Called game state. And then I want to add a public property. And in the getter, I'm just gonna return that value. But in the setter, I'm gonna set the value. But I'm also gonna fire an event. Oh, set, okay. So, I'm gonna fire an event here to let any listeners know that the game state changed. So let's create that event. First of all, let me get rid of these unnecessary usings. I'm gonna use Unity Engine Events. I'm gonna create a new class. And I'm gonna call this Game State Changed Event. And it's gonna be a Unity event that takes a game states a game manager dot game states and it'll just be an empty class so we're going to introduce you to unity events here so let's create an event variable this would be public game state changed event and we're going to call it game state change and I'm just going to instantiate it so there will always be one. Now in this setter, I'm going to call game state changed event dot invoke. Game state. So anybody listening to this event will play the appropriate music. So in start, um, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to tell the music manager to play none. And I'm going to set the game state to be get ready. And I'm going to want to add a public method here, start playing, and it will tell the music manager to play the play music, 
and it will set the game state to playing. So now we got to start working on our UI. Actually, I think I have a syntax error in here as I think about it. So this is a property setter. And I, in here, I need to be setting my private variable to be value. And as I think about this, start is not the right place to do this because this guy will get created automatically even on the title screen. So... I don't even know that I need a start menu there. And I don't know that I need update here. I think let's add a public void get ready. And this is going to do a number of things. It's going to display a get ready UI panel, which we haven't created yet. But it's also going to tell the music manager to stop playing the music. So we'll say music manager dot instance dot play music none and game states state equals get ready. And nothing is calling this yet. And I'm going to want to use, get rid of these guys because they're prefabs. So we want to go ahead and apply all our changes to these prefabs and we'll move them out of the scene. So let's just delete that. And oh, shield should be part of the star castle. So let me go ahead and drag that in there. Save all those changes and delete this. And I don't need this little header there. So now when we start playing, there should be no player and no star castle. We need something on this scene that tell the game manager that we're starting a new level. Maybe we'll call it level manager. And it'll only be specific to this scene. It won't be a singleton. Level manager. And we can add a script for it. And go ahead and put the script in manager just to keep things kind of organized. Level manager. And in start, I just want to tell the game manager get ready. And let's go back and start putting in our UI. So create a new empty game object. And we'll call this UI. And I'm going to create a new script folder. I'm going to call it UI. And I'm going to create a script in here. I'm going to call it UI Manager. And I'm going to drag it onto that little header object. And let's see, what do we want on our UI? Let's create a panel. And there we go. And we'll call this Get Ready panel and you can see by default it's created this sort of gray low alpha screen here I want to make this a little darker like that and remember it creates a canvas automatically and we want to go into our canvas we're going to go into the canvas scaler change it from constant pixel size to scale with screen size and set our reference resolution. All right. 
let's create a text object and we'll say get ready bold center it anchor it hit alt hold down alt and click that okay and then get rid of wrapping I'm gonna put some space in that text and I don't I want it to be bigger than that let's try 128 yeah that looks good all right let's create a script in here well let's put it in here so in our start method we're going to want to subscribe to that event on the game manager so we'll say game manager dot instance dot game state changed add listener on game state changed and we'll let it create that function for us let me get rid of update here and I'm actually going to add a let me change this variable name. I want this to be game state. Uh, and initially, I want to call update UI and I want to pass in game manager. Oh, did I make game state public? I did. Okay. Game manager. Game. Dot instance. Dot game state. generate that function so in here I will say um, I need to toggle my different panels on so let's add a serialized field here called game object and we'll call it get ready panel And in here, we will say get ready panel dot set active game state equals get ready. So we will only enable that panel if we are in the get ready state. And then here, whenever the game state changes, whenever the game manager tells us the game state changed, we will call update UI with that game state. And then we will expand this to handle the playing. Uh, well, I guess when the player ship is destroyed, um, I don't know that we'll have any other panels on the screen, but if we do, we can just add them in here and handle this accordingly. Go ahead and clean up my using statements. By default, we want to turn this panel off. And here comes the big test. Well, we want it to start in our title screen. Let's go to our scene, title, hit play. Okay, so we have an unassigned reference. I don't think I assigned my um, panel to our UI manager, I did not. So let's go ahead and assign our UI panel, our get ready panel. Go back to our main screen, title screen. Hit play. Okay, so that worked, but we did not stop playing the music. Uh, let's see, do I, we have our level manager. Where's our level manager? We never added the script. Go back to our title scene. All right. So now one thing we're going to want to do is we're going to want to count down. We want to change the game state to playing. So let's go into our UI manager or our level manager actually. And we want to subscribe 
two events here. So we'll say manager dot instance dot game state changed. Add listener, and we'll do the same thing here. On game, if I can type on game state changed. Let it create that function. get ready then we want to say start countdown start countdown will then invoke name of start playing after three seconds Start playing, we'll say game manager dot instance dot start playing. And by default, we're not doing anything in here, but we may do something in the future. All right. Go back to our title scene, which we're already in. Hit play. Okay, so we went from our title to get ready to is playing. The next thing we need to do is in our game manager, we need to spawn our player ship and the star castle. In fact, we should spawn that. We should spawn them both when we get into get ready. We want them to be there, uh, but there's some other things we need to do. So for instance, let's look at some of our classes here. Our enemy turret currently updates to follow the player and shoot at him. We don't want it to do that if we're not playing. So what we can do is go to our game manager here. We've got this public game state property. Let's add another public property. Bool is playing. And I'm gonna use what's called an expression body method. It's basically the same as saying get, but it's just shorthand. So I'm gonna do this equal greater than sign. And I'm gonna say game state equals game states dot playing. So if game states is game state dot playing, then we are playing. So let's go into our, we can go in our player turret where we check to see if we can fire. We can just say if not game manager dot instance dot is playing return Right, so we can't shoot if we're not playing. Don't care about that. Don't care about that. So the enemy turret, if not game manager dot instance dot is playing, return. So we won't do any of this logic. The player ship, we don't want to be able to move. So again, right here, if not game manager dot instance dot is playing return. So that takes care of all that. So now in the game manager, when we do start playing, well, when we say get ready, we want to spawn player ship, spawn star castle. So let's see, first of all, spawn player ship.
I'm going to move this. I like to put my private functions below my public methods. And let me go ahead and stub this out. Spawn star castle. In order to do either of these, we need prefabs. We need access to our prefabs. So let's create a couple of serialized fields here. Player ship prefab. Star Castle prefab. So we will instantiate player ship prefab. And here we will instantiate Star Castle prefab. All right, let's see what this does. Go back into Unity, go into our main scene. Um, actually, I need to go into our manager's resources. Open that up, click our game manager, and then from our prefabs, drag our player in our star castle. All right, let's go back into our title scene. Hit play. So we have rudimentary state going. We got our title scene, we got our main scene. We go from the title scene into the get ready state on our play scene. From get ready, we count down for three seconds and then we start playing. It's, it automatically spawned our star castle and our ship. Uh, we need to handle um, the player ship being destroyed, which will decrement our number of lives and ultimately lead to a game over state. We also want to handle when the star castle is destroyed. So let's go back into our managers, pick our game manager. We're going to want to add another property, lives. And we'll have this be a public setter or public getter and a private setter. And restart level. And in here we'll set lives to be three and we'll say get ready. So now in level manager, we'll call restart level. Now we want to have a public method, player ship destroyed, and in here we want to decrement our lives, and say if lives is greater than zero, then Game state equals get ready. Otherwise, game state actually at this point we want to change scene to game over. 
So we're gonna have to create a new scene. We will create a new text element. And I'm going to move that up a little bit. And we'll add a button. Maybe I'll add two buttons. I'll add a play again button. Call this quit button. And let's add a script. Call this play again. And we're going to have to load our scene management. start method here and I'm gonna have our music manager play music game over music and then we're gonna have a public void quit game and I think what we do here Application quit. Okay, so let's go back into our play button. We're going to click plus under on click. Let's drag in our canvas, which has our script on it. And we're going to select game over UI play again. And then for the quit button, Pick quick game. So now if we go back into our game manager,
If the player ship was destroyed and we don't have any more lives, then we'll say scene manager, load scene, game over. And then, actually we probably wanna invoke, we're gonna extract this to another function. And I'm gonna say invoke game over name of game over and we'll give it three seconds this will allow our explosion animation and sound effect to finish playing at which point it will call it will load the new scene the other thing we need to do is we need to go into our build settings And we need to load the game over scene. Start with our title scene, hit play. got here is the player ship needs to notify the game manager that we were destroyed so if we go back we got to load our player ship script let me go ahead and load the main scene here go into scripts player ship So here, where we destroy our game object, we're going to want to say game manager dot instance dot player ship destroyed. And let me look at my game manager here. Actually, what I want to look at is my star castle. Actually, what I want to look at is my, where's the enemy turret? So the initial delay is five. I'm going to put this down to something low because I want him to shoot faster to blow me up quicker. So we have a problem here. I notice a couple of issues. So this is interesting. It was still trying to track the player even though we didn't have a player ship. So when we, in the game manager, said player ship destroyed, We set the game state to get ready. I think I actually want to call get ready here. So get ready will stop the music, spawn player ship, spawn the star castle, set the game state to get ready.
a couple of problems here. Uh, one thing I noticed, I don't know if you noticed it, the Star Castle was creating new shields over and over and over again, which we don't want to have happen. So let's fix one issue at a time. I'm gonna go into our Star Castle. Um, actually, I think what I wanna do is go into our Game Manager. So, we're calling Spawn Playership and Spawn Star Castle whenever we enter into the Get Ready. And that's fine, but if we already have a Star Castle, we don't want to spawn more than one. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say, if not, find object of type Star Castle. then I will instantiate. Otherwise, I don't think I need to do anything else otherwise. So basically what this means, so the player ship got destroyed, there's already a star castle and its current state and everything should be fine. So I just wanna leave it as it is. Now in the case of the player ship, find object of type player ship, not otherwise what I want to do is reposition player ship to start position now we currently don't have a start position saved anywhere so what I'll do is I'll go back into our title scene I mean our main scene um, and actually, I'm just gonna drag, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna look at our player ship prefab. That's interesting. It's starting, oh, the player ship is within that. So I wanna reposition the player ship at this position here. So what is that, 19.8, I'm just gonna make that 20. So on the game manager, I'm gonna add a serialized field vector three start position equals I'm also going to reset its rotation to be, I believe it was 90. I'm 
policy zero, zero, 090F. And that should take care of that. Still doing this. So for some reason this is getting called even though we technically should not be playing. So let's look at the player ship. When we take damage, maybe I should do this immediately. So I'm adding this parameter to find object type to include inactive objects in our search. It's almost there. This is not working. Got to look into that. That's working. So, all right, let's look at why the quit button didn't work and so the reason it's not quitting the game is because we're in the editor so we're going to actually add a pre-processor directive here we're going to say if unity editor and if and instead of calling application quit we're going to say unity editor editor application dot is playing equals false and actually then I can also do an else and I'll move this code down into the else so in a build in a standalone build of this application this will quit would probably if we ever posted this to uh, webgl uh, we wouldn't be quitting anyway. We would probably just refresh the page or something, but um, or just not not even have the quit button. But for now, we'll assume this is a desktop application, um, or we're playing in the editor. So let's go back and hit play. And there we go. So quit works. So the other app. Uh, issue I want to look at is why the enemy turret kept shooting at us after 
after we lost our last life and the game was over. So let's go into our game manager first of all. I want to see what we're doing. So we're not calling game over, but we should still not be playing. Because when we set the state, oh, we should set state here. Game state equals player ship destroyed. This should tell the enemy turret, stop shooting at us. In fact, I should do that at the beginning of this method. That would have kept the enemy turret from shooting at us. Okay, let's see what else we do here. Pick our title scene. Hit play. So the only other thing we need to handle now is the Star Castle being destroyed. Um, as I recall, all we're doing is logging when we have a collision there. So did for the player ship. We implemented damageable. Maybe that's what I want to do on the star castle. Why am I looking for a collision on the star castle? So we're going to want to have an explosion prefab. So we're instantiating the explosion at our current position. We don't care about the rotation. We're playing the explosion sound. saying destroy game object and then we're going to tell the game manager we 
we need to add a function star castle destroy And I'm just going to make this public. So we're going to say game state equals star castle destroyed. And then we're going to invoke name of get ready after three seconds. All right, let's see if we can destroy the star castle. Oh, before we play, I want to select my star castle prefab. And I want to pick an explosion. Okay, I think those are good. Hit play. Oh, let me set these um, values back to a reasonable level. Oh, it's on the turret. I always forget that. Okay. Okay, so I see our ship is still moving. So we're going to want to stop all the movement on our ship um, before we reposition it. And then we're going to want to add some score. So I want to deal with the issue of the velocity of the ship continuing after it destroys the space station. So we're repositioning the ship, but we're not stopping it. So I think the way to handle that would be to go into the player ship script and subscribe to the game managers on game changed event. Actually, I think what I want to do here is do this in on enable and then in on disable, I want to unsubscribe. All right, so now what do we want to do in this event handler here? What I want to do. if the game state is equal to star castle destroyed then we want to take our rigid body's velocity and set it to vector 2.0 
and our angular velocity and set it to zero. I think that will do it. Let's go back in here and give this a test. button was stuck down for some reason. <laughs> So it looked like that worked. Yep, yeah, it's definitely working. It definitely stops our player ship from moving. Uh, I'm not sure what was up with the thrust button being stuck. That was very odd. I could definitely handle that instead of just returning I could set thrust to be zero and rotation amount to be zero and then return okay I think the next thing I want to do is I want to add some homing missiles uh, if we go into our star castle prefab you remember that we added these turrets around the outer ring. They're called outer turrets. And I think we're gonna do the same thing that we did with the main turret where we added a muzzle so it would know where to shoot the projectile from. Uh, so we do wanna have a muzzle on these, but the difference is gonna be instead of these shooting a projectile, um, just a ballistic projectile, we're gonna have it launch a homing missile that will chase the player. Um, so let me go ahead while we're here, and we will add a muzzle. So this one was at 0 0.173, so we want this one to be negative 0 0.173. Is that right? No, nope, because it's got to go around the other end. Okay. And let's go ahead and duplicate that. Move it here, rename it Muzzle, reset its position, move that out to the end, duplicate that, move it here, oops. Move it to the other turret, reset its position, and move it out to the end. Okay, so we've got our muzzles. We're going to want to create a script for a rocket launcher. And I think I'm going to create a folder just to start organizing. We're starting to get a lot of scripts here, so we'll call this enemy. And what will go? Well, enemy projectile can go in there, enemy turret can go in there. I 
think we want the star castle and the shield. Everything is specific to the star castle itself can go in there. Okay, it's starting to look a little more readable. I'll create a folder and call it player. And let's move these three scripts into player. All right, let's go into enemy. And we will create a C sharp script and we will call this missile launcher. And I'm going to select all four of these guys and drag that script on there. So, oops, yeah, missile launcher, missile launcher, missile launcher, missile launcher. Okay, cool. And let's go ahead and open that script up. And I know we're going to want serialized field vector 3 muzzle just like we did in the other and I guess we don't want to get rid of that update function we do don't think we need start but we can in here we can say if game manager dot instance dot is playing not is playing return I'm going to add a serialized field make this in float and I'm going to have this be fire delay and we'll default it to five seconds and I will add another attribute to this. I'm not sure if I've shown you this before. And this is really cool. So I'm saying it can be any value between one and five. And so if we go back into Unity and we look at one of these turrets, we have a little scroll bar here, a little slider because we gave it a range from one to five. Alrighty, now for our position here, hmm, it won't let me drag that on there. Because it's a vector three. Let's do this instead. Let's make this a transform And we can always just grab the position off of that. If we go back into our script in the update method. So if we're not playing, we're just going to return. That's called a guard clause. It keeps you from getting too deeply nested in your if statements. So then we want to say if can fire launch missile. Let's make a boolean the first thing we're going to say uh, we're going to need another private um, we'll call it cooldown and an on and a whoops Actually, I think what I might want to do is I do want that start method after all. And I'm going to subscribe This is just to get me past this stupid 
monitor. Okay, um, I want to take the game state changed event, add a listener. And actually, like we did in the other class, I want to do this in on enable. And on disable, we will unsubscribe, remove our listener from the event. And all we want to do in here. is if game state equals playing then we want to set the cooldown to equal the fire delay okay so our condition here to determine if we can fire first of all if the cooldown is greater than zero return false. The other thing we need to do is we need to see if the player ship is in view. Just get rid of that error for a second. If the player ship is within the arc, the arc in which the missile launcher can fire. So if we go back into our thing here, if you can imagine this thing has a firing arc, so if the ship is within this arc here, so if the enemy ship is anywhere in this area here, this thing can shoot at it. We don't want these guys shooting at the player ship if the player ship is over here. So as the ship flies around the station, the different turrets can shoot at it, as long as their barrels have cooled down. So if we go back into our missile launcher we're going to want a target which will also be a transform I don't want that to be a float I want that to be a transform and an on enable would be a good place to grab it so target Actually, the place to grab it would be here. Target equals find object of type player ship. And transform. And just to make sure we don't do anything bad if it's null. And let's see, what else are we going to want? Well, we're going to want a missile prefab, of course. And, you know, before we do this check, we want the cooldown to subtract time.delta time. So if our cooldown minus time.delta time is greater than zero, just return. Otherwise, I wonder if, do it real simple. I'll introduce you to something called Raycast. Do I have a layer for the player? I'm gonna look at the player prefab here. I do not. Let's add the player to the player layer. Oh, the player ship is on the player layer. Let me um, let me show you what I'm going to do here. If we go back into that missile launcher script, let's add a variable called player mask. We will say that player mask 
equals. So this is a little magic here. What we're doing is we're gonna get a bitwise value for a mask that we can cast class into a raycast function and it will only return a hit if we hit something on this layer. So I know this is a little bit confusing, but hopefully this will make sense after I do it. So what I'm gonna do is use the physics 2D raycast method. We're gonna use our, our position as our starting point and along the forward direction, which is transform dot up in a 2D game, going out maybe 15 units. Do we hit anything on the player mask? So actually, we're only going to shoot if the player ship is directly in front of us. So forget this whole business about a firing arc. We're only going to shoot if the player is directly in front of us. So, in update, if can fire, launch missile. And what do we want to do in launch missile? Well, let's reset our cooldown to the fire delay. And I'll show you why. We're going to instantiate at our, at our muzzle position. And with our rotation. And then this doesn't exist yet, but we're going to get the component from this guy, which is going to be a seeking missile. And I'm going to have a function on there where we can set the target because it needs to know what it's chasing. So let's go out into Unity. Let's go into our prefab, Star Castle. Look at these outer turrets. So we're gonna to need to create a missile. Okay, so, all right. How do we create a missile? Well, if we go into our 2D space kit, it just happens that there are a number of cool missiles to choose from. And I think I like this one. So let's drag this into the scene. Let's call this Seeking Missile. And we're gonna wanna bring it to the foreground, maybe about order layer in layer five. That looks pretty cool. Let's add a collider. I think a capsule collider 2D would look nice. I can't even see that. There, that looks a little bit better. Okay, what else do we want on a thing? We need a script. Let's go back into our, let's go ahead and create a prefab from that. And now let's go and add a script. We'll call this Seeking Missile. We'll drag that onto our Seeking Missile game component and update the prefab. Let's open up that script. So we know we're going to want a public method. I'm going to call it set target. It will take a transform. Target equals target. Alrighty. So what are we going to want an update? We're going to want a speed for this guy. I think I might just hard code them for now.
and we want it to have a turn speed. in a duration. I don't need to preface all these with missile. Let me just say duration. Five seconds sounds good. Turn speed, speed. What do we want to do in update? So we have a duration. So let's just decrement duration time dot delta time and then if duration is less than or equal to zero blow up so you know what that means I'm gonna go ahead and make these serialized fields I just I love to be able to change things in the inspector add a serialized field for explosion prefab. This will be a game object. And an audio clip. Okay. So blow up. What are we going to do? We're going to instantiate an explosion at our position and using quaternion identity as our rotation for the explosion. We're going to tell the sound manager to play the explosion sound and we're going to destroy this game object. Good enough. And we're going to want to take damage if something hits us. Because I, I want to let the player shoot these things and blow them up. So let's add an on collision. Enter 2D. Actually, this will tell if we hit a target. We can grab the eye damageable off of that. If it has one. Songs up. And then we want to implement I damageable. So if we take damage, we want to blow up. usings. So now we need to handle movement. Let's handle that in fixed update. So we don't want to do anything if we're not playing. Just get on the heck out of here. Then we want to get a vector to our target. dot position and we're going to subtract our position so if you want to get the direction to a target you just take the targets position and you subtract your own position and this will give you a vector and a vector 3 to that target now we want to convert this to an angle so let's do a little bit of math here. This is pretty simple math. We're just going to say 
a10 to vector to target dot y vector to target dot x and we're going to multiply that and we want to subtract 90 degrees because of the way our turrets are oriented I think that will give us an angle to the target now we want to convert that to a quaternion quaternion the forward axis and we're going to set our missiles rotation and we're going to slurp we're not going to go directly to that angle we're going to smoothly um, just smoothly gradually turn toward that direction using our rotation speed and we're going to use a built-in function called slurp so if we hover over that and let it tell us and tell us what it does. This is a mouthful. It spherically interpolates between quaternions A and B by ratio T. The parameter is clamped to the range 0, 1. Um, so it returns a quaternion that's spherically interpolated. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our current rotation, our target rotation, and then we're going to adjust it by time dot delta time, actually time dot fixed delta time, since we are in fixed update. And we're going to multiply that by our turn speed. There we go. All right. So that will give us our rotation. And then we want to move towards the target. So we're going to say transform dot translate. going to translate forward which is vector 3 dot up in a 2d object times our speed times time dot fix delta time oh, vector 3 dot That should have the missile move in the direction of the target. Rotate towards the target and then move forward towards the target. That should be all we need for the missile. So let's go take a look at this. So we want an explosion. We want an explosion sound. Speed to turn speed half a unit per second and duration five seconds. I think that's good for that prefab. We can delete this. Let's go back into our missile launcher, which is part of the Star Castle. I should have made this a prefab too. And let's see, we're gonna to wanna to take Seeking Missile. There we go. You know what else we probably would want? Is a shooting sound for the rocket launcher, for the missile launcher. And if we wanted to get really fancy, we could add a muzzle flash, but let's keep it kind of simple for now. So I'll go into the missile launcher script. We'll add another serialized field. Audio clip launch sound. So when we launch a missile, okay, so when we launch the missile, we're going to want to play that sound. But before we play the sound, let's get our missile component from here. So we're going to say missile.getComponent C. 
seeking missile. Set target, target. So that will set the target on our missile and send it on its merry way. And then we will say sound manager dot instance dot play sound effect launch sound. So we need to go back into our prefab here. And for all four of these guys, we're going to want to get a launch sound. If I go into my sounds. Actually, let's go into our free laser sounds. No. We don't really need to <laughs> spend a whole lot of time trying to find the perfect sound. I already forget which one I was using. We'll just pull one. Okay, so did I like that one? That's good enough. All right, so now, do we need to do anything else to make this work? The prefab for the Star Castle has a bunch of outer turrets that will launch missiles. We've got a seeking missile prefab, which should, oh, I know one thing we need to do. I think we want this to be an enemy, well, we wanna add a new tag for this. So there's enemy projectile. Let's add enemy missile. And then if we go into our build settings, player settings, physics 2D, and go down to our collision matrix. Enemy missiles should only collide with players and player projectiles. We don't want them to collide with anything else. All right. Well, let's go back to our title scene. Click play. So all of that was working, except I didn't see the exhaust on the missiles and they're just way too slow. Uh, that's just too easy. Uh, but I was able to shoot them and they were able to hit me. So that was all very, very nice. Let's go into our prefabs, go into our seeking missile. Let's make the turn speed faster. And let's make the speed faster. That may be too fast. And then I don't know if I want the firing delay to be five seconds. Let's make it, let's make it three seconds. Oh, oh, oh. 
Okay, so we've got Seeking Weapons. That didn't take too long to implement. Um, I think the next thing we're going to add is Scoring. Actually, before I do that, I think what I want to do is... I noticed when I was testing that that I didn't have any exhaust on the Seeking Missile. So yeah, I think what I'm gonna to wanna to do, so I have this engine exhaust that I'm using on the player ship. I'm just gonna pull this into the scene and I'm going to unpack it. If I go into prefab, unpack completely. So this is no longer associated with the prefab and I'm gonna delete this audio source. Um, I just want the visual components. Um, so, I don't want this to play that engine noise on the seeking weapons. And I'm going to rename this to Seeking Missile Exhaust. <clears throat> and I will drag that down as a prefab and delete that from here. Now, if I open up my Seeking Missile and I drag this onto it as a child and let me go into my main scene and I want to drag a seeking missile into the scene and let's see all of this stuff should already be set the way I want it. Foreground. That should, oh, it's down here. It's below, <laughs> it's below the rocket. Okay, so I'm going to pick the move tool and just drag that up a little bit. Let me zoom in here. I think that looks pretty good. So let's go back to our title scene and give this a test. Okay, so that didn't take long. Now we can start working on scoring. So let's go over to our prefabs. Actually, no, I want to go into our resources and I want to go into our managers. So we've got a game manager, a sound manager, and a music manager. I'm going to create a new one and I'm going to call it score manager. And let me go into my scripts folder. And under managers, I will create a C sharp script called score manager. I'm going to drag that onto our score manager prefab as soon as Unity gets done doing whatever it is it's doing. Alrighty. Open that up. And we want to use our singleton pattern. So I will have a public static score manager instance. And in our awake method, 
I will say if instance is not equal to null and instance is not equal to this, then destroy game object. Else instance equals this instance. Finally, okay, good. Now, what do we want to have in our score manager? We're going to want to, first of all, we're going to want to have an event. So I want to have to have a unity event public I'm not typing very well to the unity event and I'm gonna have score updated event and in here I'm gonna instantiate and we will have a public um, add score and let's have a public int score get private set It's going to initialize it automatically be initialized to zero. So here we will say score plus equals points, and then we will say score updated event dot invoke to let people know, hey, our score changed. Um, we also want to have a reset score. anything else we want to do in here we're probably going to want to handle a high score Probably going to want to have a save high score method and so we will use a player press set score this might be a good place to load Pretty good. 
So let's go into our game manager. And whenever we do game over, we want to say score manager dot instance dot reset score. Or do we want to do that when we start, when we do restart level? I think we want to do it in restart level. Now we're going to want to create some UI elements for the scoreboard. to display the score. So let's go into our main scene. And if you go under UI, you see we've got our canvas, we've got our get ready panel. Let's add a new element here. Actually, I'm gonna create an empty game object. And I'm gonna call this scoreboard. And we're gonna add a text mesh pro element. And we're gonna call it score. And let's go ahead and anchor this. Make sure all that was still correct. Okay, so we're gonna display the score in the middle of the screen. I think I wanna center that. So let's take a look at this. That looks pretty good. And then we're gonna add high score. pretty good and I think I want to display the number of lives we have up here so let's let's create another empty object here I'm gonna call this lives and I'm gonna add a component this is gonna be a horizontal layout and let me add a UI image. Um, and I'm gonna call this player life. And for the sprite, see I wanna use our ship. So let me go down to our 2D space kit, ships and stations. And I think we're using I think we're using frigate one. Yep. Now, if we duplicate this, you see that it arranges them horizontally. And then as you delete them, they go away. I don't know why I just deleted that. Let me undo that. 
because I'm going to want to create a prefab from this. <clears throat> I think that's a little bit big, though. So let me... That looks pretty good. And I'm going to want to add a script to this. So let me go up to our scripts folder, UI. I'm going to create a script. And I'm going to call it player life. And this script isn't actually going to do anything. I just want to have a comp I, I want to add it to it so I can find components of type player life. And you'll see why I want to do that in a minute. display the lives up in the upper left hand corner okay so I want to create a prefab I'm going to create a folder I'm going to call it UI and I'm going to drag that into there and I'm going to delete that oops delete that all right now I'm going to want a script for our scoreboard so let's go back into our scripts UI folder. And we will create a script and call it score UI. And we will drag that onto our scoreboard component. Let's open that up. Now I know we're going to want a serialized field. For our lives. Yeah, lives, that'll work. Actually, let's use a member variable notation. And actually before that, I'm going to want a text mesh pro score text high school text and let's have a Update score text method. So we will say score text dot text equals score manager dot instance dot score to string and high score text will be score manager dot instance dot high score to string. Now you might wonder why don't I just continually call that from update? Well, update gets called many, many, many times per frame, and there's no reason to update the score if it's not changing. So we're not gonna do that. And we're not gonna need start. Uh, I am going to have an on enable, and in here, we're going to say that score manager dot instance dot score updated event add listener on score changed. And that will call update score text.
So it, the game state that we're changing to is get ready or player ship destroyed. Then we will call update lives display. And what do we want to do in update lives display? Well, now you're going to see why I wanted to have a script called player lives attached to our player life UI. Image. So we have our lives element here. Actually, let's make this a transform. And one thing we can do is we can say var um, player lives equals lives .get component components and children player life and this will get an array of player lives from our children okay so we have our player lives and we're going to destroy them going to add back however many there are um, according to our game manager so I'm going to instantiate oh that's something I forgot We need a prefab for our player life. Let me just call it player life prefab. And we're going to parent it. to our lives transform. That should do the trick. Let's go back into Unity. And let's look at our scoreboard script here. So we need our score text. We need our high score text. We need our lives transform. And then we need our player life prefab. And the only other thing, oh, I wanted to do something here. The high score, I was centered that. I think I want that to be right justified. And then I will move it over just a tad. All right. So the only other thing we need to do is we need to actually score points. So when an enemy, pro not a projectile, but when an enemy seeking missile is destroyed, when a ring segment is destroyed and when a star castle is destroyed, we're going to want to score points. Let's do the seeking missiles first. So they already implement I damageable. We're going to say these are worth 50 points. So that's a mis missile. Okay, let's go back and look at our 
ring segment. Take damage. Ah, I even had a comment for that. Score manager dot instance dot I keep doing that. Instance dot add score points. So 10 points, I already decided for that. And then finally the star castle. I'm gonna say that's a hundred points. We're just gonna say score manager dot instance dot add score points. Let's go back to our start scene. So we got our lives, we got our score, we got our high score. You see our scores adding up. Hmm, for some reason it did not update our high score. So we definitely have a bit of a bug there. And there's a bug. And it did not seem to reload our high score. And I also didn't check to see if our lives so we're down to two lives. Okay, so we have a few bugs to work out. I need to figure out why our high score isn't always updating, even though the score was updating. That should never happen. Um, and I'm also not sure why it didn't load our high score. Oh, I see. We we up we send the event before we update the high score. We want to make sure we update the high score before we fire the event so that it will get displayed. Because if you remember, the scoreboard UI is subscribing to that event, and whenever it changes, it calls update score text. And if it doesn't get called again, it's going to show whatever it got the previous call. Um, and that also reminds me. We need to unsubscribe from these events. So that should fix that. And I think when this thing is first enabled, we should probably call Well, let's see what happens. I may have to debug this in the debugger and see what's going on. Thank <laughs> you. 
up here. So that's really odd. The high score is not loading. That is very strange. That means I must not have saved the high score. So we look at our score manager. Oh, am I never called? Zero references. Come on, Greg. Let's look at the game manager here. The time to call. That would be in game over. Right here. That should fix that. Another thing I wanted to do, I noticed the seeking weapon stuck around. I could subscribe. I could subscribe to a station destroyed event and a player destroyed event. But I think another thing I can do is I can say if the game manager game state is not equal to playing blow up. So this way, as soon as the player ship is destroyed or as soon as the star castle is destroyed, any seeking missiles on the board will blow up. I think that that would make it look a little bit better. And there was something when the last life happened, when the last ship was destroyed for the player, the player ship kind of hung around. Which I find very odd because we played the explosion sound, we instantiated an explosion. I think what I might want to do is in the player ship, I might want to just disable the ship. I don't know, let's see what happens. High score should load. Yes, okay, so we've got scoring, we've got our lives, um, we've got the high score working. So before I declare this done though, before I put a bow on it, um, there's some few tweaks and optimizations and things I wanna do, basically some polishing. So if we go into our scenes, our main scene here, I'm gonna hit play. There's some things I noticed. So first of all, if I pause, you can see there's a lot of spacing between these these ships in our player live section. 
So we don't want that. I'm gonna go into our UI, expand the canvas, expand the scoreboard. And in the horizontal layout group, we can control the amount of spacing that there is. And so let's drag in a few of these player life prefabs. So you can see we got them displayed here and they are spaced pretty far apart. If we just, now I know that I gave each of those a scale of 0 0.5. So I think that looks a lot better. So I reduced the spacing by basically half of the size. So they're 100 by 100 scale 0 0.5. So I think that's why they look so, so far apart. So by reducing the spacing by half of that width, um, you see that it, it looks a lot nicer. So I, I'm happy with that. So delete those. Uh, there's a, several other issues um, that I noticed. I did notice that when I shot at the seeking missiles, I never seemed to hit them. Um, we'll demonstrate that real quick. So my shots are going right through them. Um, we definitely don't want that. So the way I'm going to fix that, I'm pretty sure I know what the issue is. If we go and look at our seeking missile prefab, you remember I created a layer for the enemy missile, but I never assigned it. And you remember in our settings for the physics 2d settings I did set enemy missile to collide with the player projectile but I forgot to assign the layer to the missile so let's give that a test okay so I fixed that issue uh, another thing I don't like when when we're in the get ready state, the player ship is already displayed. And we go into get ready from multiple places. We go into it when we destroy the space station. We also go into it when the player ship is destroyed. I think I want the player ship to just disappear completely during those stages and only be um, spawned here when we actually start playing. So that would be done in the game manager. So up here, you see we're spawning the player ship and get ready. I think I wanna spawn it and start playing. I think that that would look a lot better when the player ship is destroyed. I'm setting it to inactive, and I want to put in some guard clauses. We go into our enemy turret. If we're not playing, we return. I'm wondering if we shouldn't check to see if our target is null. And I don't think we want to try and get the target and start since the ship might not exist yet. Yeah, I think what I want to do is an on enable. I want to subscribe to the game state changed event. Actually, I have another way to do this. I'm going to use a property. I'm move this variable down here. If my target is null, Then, I'm going to try and get it. 
and then I will return that. And now wherever we would have access underscore target, we can do that instead. Okay, that's the only place we reference it. And here I can say if target equals null return. So we don't want to do anything in here if the target is null. I think we're fine in here. Let's give all that a test, just make sure I didn't break anything. tracking me. That can blow me up. Okay, no player ship. That's good. The player ship gets spawned when we're ready to start playing. disappears when the star castle is destroyed and then respawns okay so that all looks good i'm very happy with that um one thing i noticed is that the turret i think i want the turret to reposition itself to its neutral position when the either when either the player ship is destroyed or the star castle is destroyed so let's go look at our turret here. So the rotation is normally zero. And let's see, where is our enemy turret? Here we are. So maybe if we're not playing or the target is null, instead of just returning, So that should force the turret to reposition to its neutral position, to rotate to its neutral position when the player ship is not active. And it should automatically be repositioned when it's spawned anew on a new star castle, when the star castle is destroyed. So that should be fine. I should also reset the, I was wondering if I should reset the cooldown as well. Just to make sure that when we start with the new ship, we don't get shot at immediately. Okay, those are some interesting tweaks. The next thing I want to do is I want to keep track of what level we're on. I want to keep track of how many star castles we've destroyed. And I want to increment the difficulty each time you destroy the star castle. And I also want to increase the bonus points for destroying a star castle every time. In order to do that, we're going to need to have our level manager actually keep track of what level we're on. Let's go add a level property and we're going to want to initialize this I think in on enable and 
then whenever the star castle is destroyed we're going to want to increment it okay that looks good now we're going to want to have a way to access this from all our other components I think a good way to do that would be to add a helper property to the game manager. So we've got our game state, we've got our is playing, we've got our lives. Let's add a public level manager So now we should be able to access this from anywhere through the game manager. And let's see, what do we want to do with the level? So one thing I know we want to do is when we score points for the star castle being destroyed, we want to multiply it by the number of levels. Or we want to add a bonus for the number of levels. So we're defaulting the level manager to zero and then we increment it whenever we destroy a star castle. So here we take damage. I think what we want to do here is we want to say float points equal points plus So this will, this will add the number of points times however many levels we've destroyed to the points before we score it. Okay, I like that. Now we wanted to increase the difficulty a little bit um, every time we, we destroy a star castle. So things that determine how difficult the game is I think the the speed of the seeking missiles in their turn speed would be a good place to adjust it so if we go into our seeking missiles you see we've got speed turn speed and duration I think maybe we can adjust the speed and turn speed by some factor so let's add a serialized field here and we'll say level speed adjustment and maybe something like 25% and then we'll have a property for speed instead of just accessing the, this, these variables directly what we can do is we can have a speed property which will return speed plus and actually maybe I'll make this a separate property And then wherever we were accessing speed 
in turn speed, we can instead use our property. So that should make the missiles get faster and their turn speed get tighter as the difficulty, as the levels increase. We also want to decrement our duration. So let's have a property for duration. Will be duration plus We'll just add the level to it. So we'll add a second every time we destroy a star castle. So let's add a new variable. a test and see how it works. There's something going wrong. I've broken something because we're not getting any missiles being launched. I'm wondering if maybe level manager was not. I'm gonna show you how to debug in the editor. We have a breakpoint. We have attached the debugger to Unity. Going to hit play. Okay, so we have a game manager. Our level manager is null. Let's go see why our level manager was null. So if we go into our game manager, level manager, ah, <laughs> the assignment instead of the quality operator bit me there. faster and the firing delay should be one second less I 
think I want to be able to see all that. So let's put some trace statements in here. I'm going to stop debugging. And in my seeking missile, maybe wherever we set the target, this would be a good place. I'm going to put a debug.log. And I want to say missile speed equals speed and turn speed equals turn speed and duration equals duration. So keep an eye on this console. until it launches another missile. And you can see the speed is now five, the turn speed is 1.5, the duration is five, and then the next time the speed was 5.25, turn speed was 1.75, and duration was six. Let's let that keep going. Try and destroy this again. And you can see the speed is increased again, the turn speed is increased, and the duration has increased. All right. So we have improve the uh, difficulty it will get more difficult as you continue to destroy the space station uh, i fixed a couple of um, minor cosmetic issues and i think i think this is good for the initial tutorial i think it's time to wrap this up and put a bow on it and call it done well i certainly hope you enjoyed watching this tutorial as much as i enjoyed making it it was a lot of fun and if you found it useful, do me a favor and click the like and subscribe button. It's totally free, it doesn't cost anything, and it really does help me out. And if you have any questions about anything I covered in this video, drop a comment and I'll read it and get back to you as soon as I can. And also let me know if there's anything you'd like to see me cover, maybe some other games you'd like to see me do a tutorial for. And let me know if you prefer this format, these long tutorials, or my live stream format, or maybe quick unity tips videos i really want to make this channel as useful as possible to as many people as possible so thanks again for watching and good luck on your game development journey